welcome everyone today to another Sol the Solanese seminar online. And today we're very glad that we, oh, sorry that I'm forgetting to record actually. So yes, so today in this new Solanese seminar online, we have uh, Stephen Dotsworth. And Stephen did, did his undergraduate degree at the University of Cambridge followed by a master's in biosystematics at the Imperial College of London, but based at the Natural History Museum. Following this, he did a PhD at Queen's Mary University of London, focusing on genomics, evolution of repetitive DNA and phylogenetics of Nicosiana sections flaviolentis. After his PhD, Stephen moved to Kew as a phylogenomics research fellow the, and then senior researcher on the Plant Tree of Life project. And in 2018, he moved to the University of Bedfordshire as a senior lecturer to lead their biological science course, whilst researching various aspects of plant genomics, phylogenetics, and ecology, including also the evolution of repetitive DNA and diploidization processes on several angiosperm groups, but still with a very strong focus on Nicosiana. So today he's going to present his work that he's been working with Mark Chase on the recent radiation of Nicosiana sections radiolentis and cytogenetic, ecological, and phylogenomic, phylogenomic um, insights. So thank you, Stephen, to present today. And now if you want to share your screen, well, we, can, we can start. Thank you so much. Um, let me see. Okay, can we see that? Yes, that's perfect. Perfect. Oops. So thank you. Thanks for inviting me to um, to give this talk today. It's really nice to to chat about this uh, group that we've been working on. And um, oops, go back to this one. And what I want to do, hopefully, it won't be too uh, too ramshackled, but it may be. Um, I just kind of want to give a flavour of all the different things that we've been doing recently. Uh, and what's really interesting about this group of Nicotiana. So there is quite a lot of a focus on the, um, the phylogenetic relationships, but I've tried to also put in more now about uh, the cytogenetics. So chromosome number and genome size that we're very interested in and some of the recent stuff we've been looking at in terms of ecological niche modeling. Um, okay, so what I decided to do was at the start, um, start with the acknowledgements. So there's, this is a massive, massive collaborative effort, really. So I myself have been working on, um, working on this group since my PhD, and it's getting close to 10 years. I had to count and check, but it's not quite a decade, but it's almost a decade now that I've been working on this group. And um, others, so Mark, so Mark Chase is really been working on this and and brought me into it as a PhD student has been working on it for close to 20 years probably along with uh, Sandy and uh, Andrew Leach at Queen Mary so they've been working on Nicotiana for a lot longer and we've been this has always been kind of like the the group within Nicotiana that's always been a little bit difficult always super interesting and I'll come on to some of the reasons why but always a little bit difficult to study and when I started my PhD, I really wanted to kind of take it to a next level and try to try to build up um, the work that we've been doing on different aspects of, of Section Suave Lentes. So I must, there's so many people, I won't name everyone, but in particular, the people underlined. So Mark and Martin uh, at Q and also Oscar have helped a lot either with, you know, leading the projects funding, field work, general expertise on the group um, for a long time. Andrew Leach, who is also my PhD, main PhD supervisor at Queen Mary. Felipe has been working with us um, recently on the, particularly on the chromosome work. He's a fantastic cytogeneticist, which has just taken the, the cytogenetics to the next level. A big group of people in Vienna, so um, Rose Samuel video uh, and their new postdoc Louise um, on an FWF funded grant who have done a, a huge amount of work now on the, phy the phylogeny that we'll get to a bit later based on rad sequencing and various other aspects really as well. 
uh, Maita, who is a close colleague and friend of mine, who really led most of the niche modeling work I'll talk about right at the end. And finally, of course, the Q team, particularly Olivier, uh, the Pafdol team uh, for the Angiospans 353 type work. And a, and a whole bunch of different funders over recent years. So what I want to do really is begin by talking about the, the group as a whole. So a little bit about Nicotiana, where Section Suavulenti sits within the genus, something about its distribution, some of the quirks of the biology in this group that, that have kind of drawn us to it or that make it a very interesting, um, an interesting group to work on. And some of the recent work in terms of the new taxa as well that kind of relates to the distribution and the field work that we've been doing over a number of years. And then want to shift into the phylogenetics of the group. So in, initial problems, if you like, or initial results based on Sanger sequencing. And then move into our new, new results, if you like, based on both Angiosperms 353 probe set and, uh, and then RAB sequencing. And then finally, I want to spend some time thinking a bit more biologically, if you like, or about the aspects of biology in this group that are, are really fascinating to us. So kind of the genomics and the ecology. And it's really, I must say, it really is preliminary still, uh, most of this, but um, it, we're further along than certainly than we were 10 years ago. And uh, hopefully you will agree there are things here that are really interesting and I'll give you a flavor of some of the preliminary results we have gathered recently and some of the uh, stuff that we want to do uh, in the future. Move this out of the way. So uh, as many of you will know, you'll be very familiar with the genus Nicotiana. So for a Solanaceae audience, I don't have to say too much, but uh, this genus includes uh, roughly 80 species or so, although it's increasing by the by the minute. And it includes the common smoking tobacco, the Cotiana tobaccum, which is a recent allotetraploid. Um, so it's it's a it's a polyploid species. And actually what happens in the Cotiana is that polyploidy happens a lot. And I'll come on to that in the next slide or so. So there's this frequent propensity for polyploidization. So hybridization with whole genome duplication in the group. Um, and Suavulentes, that's also the case, but it's a bit, there's other stuff happening now post polyploidization, which we'll come on to. We also have uh, the model Nicotiana benthamiana, which is used extensively as a model for plant viral interactions uh, due to its susceptibility to a wide range of viruses. So here's our tobacco. There's also, of course, a number of species that are very common in horticulture, including a number of hybrids, particularly of um, Nicotiana alata, um, but many others as well. Sylvestris um, is very nice scented uh, with the droopy long uh, white flowers is very, very common in horticulture. There are also invasive species such as the tree tobacco, um, Nicotiana glauca, with, with which many people will be familiar. Uh, it's quite beautiful in a way, but it, it is invasive all, all across the globe. And so one of the one of the fantastic things about Nicotiana from kind of a, a genomic point of view, really, but but also kind of just from the biology is that there's this recurrent polyploidy that has occurred over different time scales. So here on the left uh, is a summary of the uh, diploid taxa, um, or most of the diploid taxa within the group. And then here we're forming off the various polyploids. So Nicotiana tobacco is formed between uh, Sylvestris here and Tomentosiformis. And then of course it's been extensively studied due to um, the commercial interest in that. Very recently, we're not entirely sure whether it, there are natural populations, pro probably difficult to find these days. There are others that are recently formed such as Rustica from Undulata and Nitiana here. Some that are formed from more closely related taxa, such as Arensii, but these are all very young polyploid taxa. They all retain the expected number of chromosomes here. So the diploid number is n equals 12. So these will have n equals 24 that you would expect for a new allotetraploid. 
We then have a couple of species that are a little bit older. And these dates are, are revised dates from the, uh, Clarkson et al. 2017. Uh, again, these retain pretty much the same number of chromosomes and similar kind of genome size that you would expect from doubled number of taxa. We then have section rapandi here formed from obtusifolia probably and sylvestris or, or a species close to the, those extant diploids. Again, these also have 24 pairs of chromosomes, very similar to one another in many ways. And these are a little bit old, about 4 million years. And then finally, we get this group called uh, section suaviolentes, which now is, is definitely going to be over half of the currently described taxa in the genus. And this is the oldest group, probably about 6 million years old. Again, um, Sylvestris is the one of the parental lineages or something close to that. But the maternal progenitor of this group is either something extinct um, and probably a hybrid that is actually already um, extinct. So it's a complex hybrid origin of this group. And then what's really interesting in Suaviolentes is that they have then, since that uh, tetraploid origin, they have started to lose chromosomes or they have just started to drop in chromosome number, which we'll come on to later. So we have, this is the oldest uh, polyploid group within the genus. We have the most species, we have changes in chromosome number, we have extensive changes in genome size. Uh, we do have quite a lot of morphological change, um, which I'll come on to as well. And we also have aspects of the, the habitat and the ecology, particularly within Australia, that are, are quite unique and interesting. So in terms of their distribution, most of the species of Suaviolentes are found within Australia. There are a few taxa uh, within the, uh, to the east of Australia and the South Pacific. So on New Caledonia, uh, there's one that's endemic to the Marquesas Islands, which is smack bang in the middle of the South Pacific. And the species that is sister to the rest, to all of the other ones in the section is actually Nicotiana africana, which is endemic to Namibia. So there's one in Namibia and then all the rest are pretty much in Australia with a few in the South Pacific. But even within these, most of the diversity is found right within the, the harsh arid center of Australia. So close to and around um, Uluru or Ayers Rock, uh, which is, as you'll know, is by Alice Springs right in the middle of um, the Australian desert, which we'll come on to in a bit. So that's kind of quite a fascinating in itself, at least for me. And the problem we've had previously is, it's actually twofold. One is a lack of uh, good quality, wild sourced, verified material, things that we're sure of the ID or that we have good specimens that we can go back to and, and check. And the other is uh, in terms of the relationships is a lack of resolution in standard um, phylogenetic markers. And I'll come back to that um, as we move into phylogeny. So here is a distribution of section suaviolentes in Australia. And these are all the records um, in the Australian virtual herbarium, just to show you that actually the distribution is across the continent. But there are um, some regions where there are, there are more collections and actually there are, there are more species. Uh, there's more species richness in the center here. Now over the last, um, yeah, probably over the last 10 years, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of field work to collect as many um, of these taxa as possible. Uh, this is from probably maybe our first trip. So here's me and his mark. And you can see this wasn't a great season. So um, they were very dry, lots of dry sticks here that we weren't really sure what they were, um, but we did manage to, to collect seeds and specimens to study later. Now, um, Mark and particularly Martin, Mark and Martin together have been doing much more fieldwork than I have across um, all of Australia. So here we've got different field, uh, field trips, field seasons uh, plotted um, across um, all the collections plotted on Australia. So you can see, I think the ones in red are 2016. So that was a, a particular, particularly good year for uh, uh, specimens from all different parts of Australia. So we've now covered quite a lot of the known diversity. 
and quite a lot of the geography, which of course is a bit challenging considering the, the, the size and distribution here. We've also been able to take advantage of recent herbarium collections. So if we plot those on as well, we can start to fill in some of the gaps there you'll see where um, it's either been inaccessible or you know, mul in multiple tries, the, the weather hasn't been good enough, it hasn't been a good year, etc. So we've really amassed a lot of um, material here uh, in recent years to help us really understand what the taxa are uh, and how they're related to one another, because everything else we're interested in hinges, uh, hinges on those basic questions really, and that basic understanding of, of their biology. So um, a bunch of the new species were uh, published a couple of years ago now, and uh, there are probably many more, we think. Um, so this is a kind of guess always the case when you set out to, to study a particular group, perhaps that hasn't been extensively collected. Um, and uh, there may be other reasons in terms of the, the cryptic, um, cryptic morphology of some of these taxa as well. There are certain dumping ground taxa where things have been chucked into that, but they're obviously distinct. And uh, these new species really vary as well. So here we have an absolutely tiny one. It's really cute. It's like a sort of miniaturized in every way. The leaves are miniature, uh, the flowers are really tiny. Um, it's got some characteristics to Benthamiana and Embratica, but it's really, it's a very distinct thing. Um, Nicotiana carrageni. Um, and then we have other ones that are giants. So this one with me for scale, uh, which has been included variously in uh, Velutina or Mar Maritima. Um, it's kind of supersized. You could see a few similarities, but it's really rather different um, in terms of habit, in terms of the flowers, in terms of the vestiture and so on and so forth. And this was not difficult to find. So um, from the name, this is, this is a gorge dweller. So it's, I think here we were in um, one of the gorges within the Flinders Ranges, a very popular tourist um, spot and so on. And just hang on a minute, what is this uh, giant one over here? It's something, it's actually something different. So we've discovered things that obviously have been collected, have been easily accessible, but have been confused or, or lumped in with others. And other things that seemingly haven't been collected or, um, most things had been collected, but they just the, the uh, they hadn't necessarily been sorted out, if you like. And the Cotionas uh, in this group even grow on Uluru itself. So, I mean, my eyes aren't good enough, and the photos probably aren't good enough. But if you if they were, you could focus in on these little pockets here, uh, on right on Uluru itself. And we were extremely fortunate to um, be able to go up the rock with um, some Aboriginal guides. Of course, it's a, it's a sacred place, it's a sacred land. And um, you'll see us here collecting this one, Cotiana gossii, which is also a prized uh, chewing tobacco by Aboriginal peoples. And it grows literally right up in these little crevices, hiding, if you like, hiding from the harsh sun, perhaps hiding from, from uh, the drought conditions. A beautiful, beautiful plant. And most of these species are kind of, well, they're, they're small herbaceous white flower things. So some people may say, well, they all look the same. And some of them are very difficult and tricky. We'll come back to that. But I, the point I just want to make now before moving into phylogeny is that some of these are extremely distinctive and on multiple levels. So this one, Burbidgee, uh, grows in a very, very localized area. It has these massive flowers. You can't see it as well here, but it has quite sort of strange rounded leaves. It has quite a strange habit and it's more kind of sort of leaves going up the stem uh, than anything um, rosette forming, etc. cetera. Um, you wouldn't confuse it with anything else. Maritima is a coastal species, extremely hairy, extremely fat little flowers. Uh, Velutina usually found on red sand, sometimes on other substrates. 
from the name yet, velvety kind of leaves, a particular type of branching of the inflorescence, a very, um, very easy species to, to spot, generally speaking. And then there are others as well. Uh, there's a final one, uh, such as truncata for the, the truncate calyx here. And apart from that character, uh, this species is so distinctive, you could not confuse it with anything else. It also grows only in one tiny little area. It grows, um, here's a picture here, almost like a kind of primula. It's really crazy, it's, it's this like nothing you would expect really in the, you know, the driest, hottest part of the Australian continent. Um, so it grows this kind of rosette with the leaves sticking uh, you know, pressed to the ground and then with these inflorescences coming up and the bunching of the flowers in the inflorescence and the truncate calices, it couldn't be anything else. So there are a number of distinct taxa here um, and they also have distinct ecologies. They're either out in the open like this and they, they grow quickly after rain, they set seed, they die, typically speaking, or they're perhaps hiding um, not on, you know, not on a south facing slope and uh, in particular rock crevices, rock outcrops, or on particular substrates. So it seems like in this group, there's a bunch of different things going on, um, either to cope with the environmental conditions or indeed just uh, the process of adaptation to a variety of conditions across, um, across Australia. So if we move now to think a bit about the phylogenetics and the relationships of these, so our initial problems I kind of outlined earlier uh, were twofold. One, that most of the material that we had or we had access to previously wasn't necessarily reliable. Some of it from seed banks, some of it of unsure um, uh, provenance. And also we're still, even then, even with the, the number of species that there were say 10 or 20 years ago, there's still not that many taxa. And as you can see, just in these two examples here, with ITS and with MACK, there's very little resolution. There's extremely num low numbers of um, parsimony informative characters here in the ITS. And here in the reanalysis of MACK, just showing the collapsed branches where there's really no real support. So we kind of knew that we needed two things. We needed better material and we needed more material of more species and taxa. And we also needed to throw some other methods at this. We needed to throw more molecular data at the problem in order to try and get at the phylogenetic relationships. So one of the first things we did was a genome skimming approach. Um, I should say probably at this point that I'm not really talking about any methods in really much detail at all. This is more of a kind of, um, yeah, bi biology talk, if you like. But um, if, you, if you want to ask about any of the methods in more detail, please do at the end. But genome skimming essentially, as most of you will know, is just sequencing a small part of the genome using these high throughput methods. And typically you get things that are in high copy. So the plastid or mitochondrial genomes and uh, ribosomal DNA. So we got a lovely, uh, lovely resolved tree with uh, the plastid genome, but it's essentially kind of just a random mix, at least within the core um, Australian groups here. And what we think this was, reflects is a, a rampant amount of ancestral polymorphism. On the other side, on the flip side with the um, full length RDNA cistron, so including ITS and the, and the coding genes and spaces, we get some clustering of, of taxa that makes sense. So our ideas of, of, of what species are in this group made a bit more sense, but there's very little resolution or much less resolution along the backbone. So that again, doesn't help us so much because as soon as you want to look at character or trait evolution um, along the tree, you really need a well-resolved uh, tree throughout. And just as a final kind of pictorial summary of that, you can see this is comparing the two, the two trees to one another. So RDNA on the left and plastome on the right. And um, yeah, this kind of, shows shows the problem if you like there's a huge amount of incongruence and we think it's been due to a large amount of polymorphism in the plastome haplotypes being retained 
So we know we need more nuclear data, um, but but what to do? Now, in an ideal world, we would just you know sequence all the genomes. Um, in fact, during my PhD, I got told that a lot um, in committee meetings. You know, why don't you just sequence the entire genomes? And the problem is, we're talking about three gigabase pairs upwards, and the number of genomes we would have needed to answer some of these basic questions would have been huge. So we will get there, I'm sure, at some point soon. But um, as many of us working on more systematic problems know, we, we can't really afford to do that. Um, and perhaps we don't need it. And um, of course, there are multiple different types of approaches. We can kind of cross off genome skimming because unfortunately, the data that we get from that has been less than ideal, as I've just discussed. So we're really looking at other approaches such as RADSeq, um, HypeSeq, or possibly transcriptomes. Transcriptomes, again, is always limiting in terms of um, both the cost and the need for fresh, good tissue for RNA. So what we decided to do, to do was kind of twofold, look at um, a RAD sequencing approach and a hybridization probe-based approach. So the first thing I want to show you is a very, very small number of taxa comparing these approaches explicitly. So here we have um, a very small number of taxa, the exact same taxa for which we have angiosperms 353 data. So this is a set of universal angiosperm wide probes that we developed at Q, um, which I've removed. Unfortunately, didn't have time, so I've removed a whole bunch of slides about that. But please do ask if you have any questions about the, those probes. And comparing this to a double digest restriction site associated uh, sequencing set. And as you can see here, we've only got um, about six or seven species, um, and some of them with multiples for, for each species, but we essentially recover the same relationships with strong support in either approach. So we kind of knew, or we took this as some evidence that we could use either approach, or, and actually what we did in the end was to run with both uh, kind of in parallel. Although by far we have the most complete, um, most useful data set now is from the from our rad sequencing. But um, we did want to investigate whether something designed for conserved low copy of nuclear genes across uh, deep angiosperm phylogeny would be of any use whatsoever for a very recently evolved uh, intractable radiation. The answer was surprisingly yes. So first I'm just going to run through some expanded sampling then from for the A353 data. So we don't have as that, that many taxa here really, but we have about a third of the section covered. And we try to pick species from across the group. So some of the um, earlier lineages, as well as uh, the core radiation within Australia. And we've also tried to include multiple accessions for some of those species as well, to see whether these do cluster together in our phylogenetic. Uh, trees. Um, and just to, to summarize those here, so we do get pretty good resolution um, of our tree. I've got an explicit comparison, oops, in a couple of slides of the coalescent analysis versus the super matrix one. Um, of course, we know this is flawed for many reasons, but actually they're, they're very, very similar uh, in this group. Now there are a few um, a few parts of the tree which are not so ideal, particularly um, that I've zoomed in on here on the backbone, where we have low posterior local posteriors, and as you can see from the quartet values in the pie charts, um, this indicates a, a very large amount of ILS incomplete lineage sorting going on, uh, which makes sense uh, for a recently evolved group. We know that there's a um, huge amount of polymorphism in the plastome there must be a reflection of this biology within the nuclear genome as well. Uh, so this is, is unfortunate, but it may be biological reality. We don't know yet whether increased sampling um, or increased analyses here may kind of tidy it up a little bit, but generally um, it's, it's pretty good, surprisingly good, uh, considering how difficult the group has been. Here I'm explicitly comparing the two approaches. So we have uh, the coalescent 
on the left versus the super matrix. And essentially the only difference is, um, is the switching here where Umbratico's uh, sister is swapped with Bentamiana. So even, even using a, a super matrix type approach, a concatenated approach, uh, we get very similar results. What we have done, um, like I said, more now we've, we've almost all taxa, if not all taxa have been sampled um, using rad sequencing. And so here we have all species or, or hopefully everything we've, we're, we're still amassing it uh, at the moment. So this is really work by uh, a video Rose and, and Louis in Vienna um, and with Mark. And so those they have they are really increasing and increasing the amount of taxa that we have um, for rad sequencing. And so here, based on a huge number of SNPs, we get very very good resolution of of the tree. And I won't go through it um, really step by step at all, but just to say that uh, some of it makes some of it concords with um, our early analysis, even based even with the incongruence in the RDNA and the plastomes. So for instance. Um, Fatuhevensis is um, from the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia, um, Fatuheva and the other and other islands there. This always comes out um, as a sister to most of the uh, or all of the Australian ones. Forsteri is one on the east coast of Australia, and most of these species here in these lineages have uh, larger, higher chromosome numbers, so similar to the ancestral state. Come on to it later. But we have generally good support, um, even for our EG expanded sampling here of Benthamiana, so the model. And this within Benthamiana allows us to look at where that the lab rat plant has actually come from. So which of the wild populations is it most closely related to within Australia? And we're also looking at now how that relates to the viral susceptibility of some of these wild populations, because they're not um, they're not the same. So that's quite a sort of an interesting within species um, thing that we're now able to do with this expanded rad sampling as well. So just to skip and show you another bit of the tree, we also have many species here that we think are new, or we have many taxa here that we think are new species. And we've kind of used the uh, phylogenetic phylogenomic framework now from the rad data to reciprocally illuminate um, studying the morphology. So these plants, most of them have been grown up in the greenhouse and Mark and Martin have been really scoring the characters and looking at uh, how these are distinguished morphologically and whether we can make sense um, of it. And typically, generally speaking, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff here that does make sense. There are a lot of things that didn't quite fit and you could see that that's actually something distinct. Um, and in other cases, uh, it's a little bit difficult. So there are probably some kind of species complexes, even within the section Suave Lentes, where there's a lot going on. And it could either just be one sort of ongoing incipient speciation process, or it could be that we just need to kind of figure out a little bit more um, what makes certain lineages distinct from one another. Uh, with these data, we can also do um, other coalescent type analyses and look at um, the generation time. Uh, so here you can see that, in fact, this is still rather reduced sampling due to the computation, but most of the core Australian species are very, very recent. Um, so tentatively, we, we've been saying before, you know, one or two million years, but really much of this diversification is very, very recent, more recent than that. And if you take and show all these photos, um, from the front of the flower, looking at the corolla lobes, you might think they're all the same. <laughs> you might be all very similar white, white flower things. So I'm going to flip what I said earlier on and say that some of them are fairly cryptic. So you have this cryptic morphology, but actually there is distinct genetic divergence. And so we're kind of using uh, our new phylogenetic framework and growing the plants from all, um, all of our amassed collections and going back and forth to try and work out um, the species concepts within this group. But it should also just also make the point that sometimes this is what you're collecting in the field. 
um, squitty little tiny things that haven't really grown. And actually a lot of herbarium specimens are like that as well. And those are very, very tricky. So you, you will have to look at things such as the hair morphology, um, but some of them may remain rather difficult to identify as herbarium specimens as well. Right, so I have gone on way too long already, but I will now switch to think a little bit about the genomics and the ecology. Um, and I'll try not to overrun too much. Do feel free to stop me if I go on a bit too long. So one thing I didn't mention too much earlier in the talk is that uh, this is a, a monophyletic group. We've known that for many years, even though that we, we couldn't necessarily resolve the relationships. And they have a, a tetraploid, a complex allotetraploid origin. So this would give them a, a chromosome number of n equals 24. But we, but in, in Suavia lentes, rather than any of the other polyploid groups, there's a disploidy going on here. So there's a chromosome number series where the numbers are descending from 24 back to close to the diploid-like number of 12. So we have records now down to n equals 15. There have been some ones down to n equals 14. We haven't managed to verify those yet uh, in the lab. So Felipe um, in Brazil has been working really um, intensively on the chromosome number counts and soon we will, we will work more on other aspects such as uh, fish and gish studies uh, to look at painting the chromosomes to see how has this chromosome number changed um, occurred or rather how are the chromosomes rearranged and how does that relate to the biology of these taxa. So we've been able to find counts for our new species and new material, verify and confirm previous counts and also find species where we have variation uh, between populations. So it's almost like we're catching this chromosome number change in the act. Uh, and we, there's, there's so much that we really want to look at here. This is just the beginning in terms of how this diploidy may, rela may relate to uh, the general diploidization, post polyploidization and the diversification of these species. In terms of the genome size, uh, we knew um, a number of years ago, this is a figure from my PhD thesis, even with a, uh, a terrible phylogeny, we still, we knew that most taxa had reduced their genome size, somewhere around three picograms on average. Um, and we see that now with much more extensive sampling, with a good phylogeny and uh, with much more extensive sampling of genome size. Most of the, particularly of the core Australian taxa show a genome size reduction, which is to be expected in the process of, of diploidization. And what I've got here is a final kind of summary of our latest estimates of uh, genome size and chromosome number for most of the species uh, mapped onto our current estimate of the phylogenetic framework for the, for the section. So this is based on, this is our rad sequencing uh, tree here. And uh, here we have uh, genome size and chromosome number um, inferred with base traits. And here the actual data in the middle. And the kind of general picture in terms of genome size that I mentioned on the last slide holds in that most of them are around uh, three. There are actually several clades where we are under three picograms. And the general picture is one of genome downsizing, but actually uh, it's uneven across the tree. So there are some clades where uh, the genome size has, has become smaller than others. So here in this group, including the uh, simulans type clade, it's, it's under three, about 2.7. Whereas in this group up here, it's remained above three, up to about three and a half. And it does not correlate with then chromosome number because these ones at the top have the smallest chromosome counts, uh, smallest number of chromosomes, 15 or 16, but a larger genome size than these ones who typically have 20, 21 uh, chromosomes but have a smaller genome size. So genome size and chromosome number evolution seem to be decoupled, although there, there does seem to be uh, independent drops in chromosome number and independent change as well in genome size in a, with a broad pattern of genome size reduction, which often happens post uh, polyploidization. 
So this is really nice. This gives us a first insight into um, questions that we've had around chromosome number change and allows us now to look in more detail uh, within particular clades and to see what's actually going on, which chromosomes are, are producing, how are they rearranging, and how does this relate to the adaptation process or the speciation process within this group? Finally, I want to talk um, just briefly about the as some of the aspects of ecology of Suaviolentes. So, um, as I kind of mentioned much earlier on in the talk, they are distributed across the Australian continent and they do have, some of them are very distinctive morphologically, some are more difficult, more cryptic, but they do often have distinctive ecologies as well and perhaps microhabitats and substrate preferences. So I've just tried to capture some of that here. You can see the difference between some that are growing out in the open and, and others that are growing in rock crevices, outcrops and gorges. There are differences in substrate, some on sand, some on particular types of um, gypsum soil, some always shaded and particularly under um, partic uh, particular species like acacias, types of acacia. So we know that they're, despite them, yes, uh, being widespread uh, as a group, we have localized endemics, we have morphological differences, we have genome size chromosome differences, uh, and we, we actually have big differences in, in their ecology. And some of these, more, like I said, will be quick ephemerals, so they will come up after a good rain, they'll grow, they'll set seed, and then they'll die down to nothing again, waiting in the seed bank for favorable conditions. Others will seemingly be perennial, if they've found a good spot and they develop along a good taproot and you can see multiple years growth on some of the larger specimens in the wild. So as a first pass here, what we wanted to do was look at whether these kinds of, of field ecology uh, observations and microhabitat differences are also played out in a broader uh, ecological niche modeling um, type approach. So if we use very broad parameters of the climate, can we actually capture differentiation um, in the ecology of these taxa? Uh, so here we've got uh, the, this is based on the A353 expanded tree. So it's not uh, as extensive as the, as the rad one yet, um, but it's based on that one. So we've got a number of different species, as I said, that were chosen to be across uh, the different known clades and the different parts of Australia and the different uh, um, environments as well. And we found that the two variables that explain most of the variation in the, the first two principal components were uh, related to temperature. So the mean temperature of the coldest quarter and the annual temperature range. So these do seem to be important for defining the niches of these species. We then really wanted to ask whether uh, we could see with the niche models at this kind of scale, uh, a differentiation in the niches of uh, across the group and whether that related to e.g. the phylogenetic distance between them or to aspects of geography. So we took a twofold approach here. And firstly, we estimated niches purely in environmental space. That's what you see here. Um, for a selection of the taxa. We then took a, a second approach where we projected it back into geographical space, um, which is a, using a Maxent model here. And we use these two different types of niche estimation to then look at all to all pairwise comparisons to see whether there's any evidence for either niche conservatism or niche divergence. Um, looking across Suaviolentes. What we found overall is that there's quite low levels of overlap between all pairwise comparisons. So here's a summary of the overlap results. And we have two different metrics, uh, Schoener's D and Warren's I. 
and uh, the top ones here are environmental space comparisons and the bottom ones are MaxM. But they're in broad agreement, although you'll see for the MaxM models, there's a kind of a bit of a wider distribution um, with greater overlap for some pairwise comparisons. Uh, MCP here is the level of geographical overlap of the polygons. If we look at how this relates to geography and phylogeny, we see that closely related species tend to have more similar niches. So that's the trend that we're seeing here. So um, this is smaller phylogenetic distance, greater overlap in niche space. Excuse me. Um, so there's evidence here for a general background of niche conservatism. We also see an overlap between geography geographic overlap and niche overlap, which makes sense. Things that are closer in space are typically going to have more similar niches because they're estimated from the climate variables at those points. However, with the, uh, so these, sorry, were the environmental space comparisons and here are the Maxent ones. And in the Maxent ones, actually, we find many more uh, pairs that are less similar than by chance. So using just environmental space here, we found some pairwise comparisons that were more similar by chance. So we thought well, perhaps it's, it's all about um, niche conservatism. And, but with the MaxN models, you see a slightly different thing. Generally, the trends are the same here, um, but we see all these ones, the squares here, where they are less similar. Pairwise comparisons were less similar than by our null model. Um, so that suggests that there is some divergence going on. Okay, I haven't gone on too long, let me check. Almost on time, perfect. So just to summarize that then, so we think that there is generally a background of niche conservatism. So closely related species uh, tend to occupy more similar niches. But there may be, based on the general, generally low levels of niche overlap, and some of these different uh, measures here based on the Maxent models, some role for for niche divergence. And of course, the the niche models and uh, the results you get here are, are only as good as what you put into it. So, if we uh, if we agree, if we feel that actually some of the the main drivers are substrate or other aspects that aren't captured in those broad bioclim data, then they won't be picked up in these. So again, it's kind of surprising, even with this first pass approach, that we see something quite interesting. So just to summarize uh, then what I've tried to cover today. So we now have a pretty good um, phylogenomic framework for the section. And actually, we have some really encouraging results, even in, from the, the A353 low copy genes. Um, but we have a much bigger expanded sampling for RADSEQ. And this is despite very extensive ILS within the group. We know that we have, and um, we're showing it even more with more and more analyses that we do, that we have very recent diversification of the core Australian group. And we've now been able to amass more data on genome size and chromosome number that allows us to get at questions of chromosome speciation and adaptation. So we know that there's reduction genome size, genome downsizing. We know that there's lots of descending diploidy, but we're not sure whether they're clearly linked or how they're linked, but we can now get at that uh, within this comparative framework. And finally, we see some evidence for potential niche divergence, despite a general background for niche conservatism. And these two things are, are not mutually exclusive. Um, so in terms of future work, these are the kinds of things that we're, we're thinking about now that relate to the stuff I've spoken about. So we really want to get at which genomic and ecological processes are driving divergence and speciation and how have they adapted to drought conditions? How has adaptation varied across the group? Does this relate to the genome restructuring? So what's happening in those rearranged parts of the genomes uh, where the chromosomes have uh, reduced and, and fused in complex ways? Is that linked um, explicitly to adaptation or is it a byproduct? 
uh, and indeed to this, the speciation process. And finally, in terms of the ecology then, is there really evidence for niche, niche divergence or conservatism? Is there any stronger evidence or not, either using different more fine scale variables or using stricter sister species type comparisons based on um, an expanded um, phylogenetic framework rather than our auto or pairwise comparison that I showed today. And that, I believe, yes, that is it. So thank you very much. And I'll be delighted to take any questions now. I apologize for going slightly over. No, that's perfect. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. That was a great, great talk. Um, let me see if we can, yes, I can. Yeah, so there is several questions that are uh, really interesting. Like first was um, uh, Dick Olmstead was asking about um, the current estimated species number for section swapping languages. But the market really would like that is uh, rough, roughly 50 species. Um, yeah. So, yeah, roughly 50, but there are, as you saw, the hints of there are these new taxa that probably will be described soon. So it's constantly going crawling up slowly. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. um, then, well, I also have a question like, um, if you, um, it's super interesting all the results about the niche modeling and uh, like uh, all the inference that you can do about uh, um, adaptation or even like how these groups have evolved and has evolved. And have you observed like or inferred um, any link between um, a particular morphological trait or even the chromosome number with the how broad is the niche of a particular group within the section? Yeah, very good question. No, is the, is the answer not yet. But those are exactly the, the types of things that we want to look at in more detail. So, yeah, it's one of these one of these groups where there there really is there's a lot going on. And like I said, there are there are parts, the kind of com complexes within it, where the morphology is really difficult. You know even with them all grown side by side, you might just about kind of work it out and the genetics maybe are still not clear. But then there are others where there are really distinct um, morphologies. One thing I, I didn't say is that the, which is, but is generally true, is that the vegetative morphology is quite variable. So previous keys, for example, have, have been, have relied on whether it has a rosette, uh, a strict rosette or not, you know, any leaves on the inflorescence. This is totally variable depending how it grows, how much rain there was, how many nutrients. Um, but certainly there will be some interesting, um, some interesting things to be found out by looking at the morphology and, and in context with the niches and the, and the new uh, phylogeny, definitely. And the flowers are also quite variable. Some are really absolutely tiny and some are huge. And the degree of selfing also seems to be variable. So. There's there's so many things to uh, hopefully to look at in the future. Yeah. Yes, but all the flowers are white, right? So it's a very yes. Uh, yeah, all of the flowers are white. They have various degrees of kind of a purple flushing. I'm guessing it's more of a protective UV um, type thing, perhaps because usually in the bud. Um, so some of them like you're like wow, it's bright purple, but it's just um, a flushing of the of the corolla tube before it opens. I don't know that much about that. Um, if if someone wants to comment on that, that would be great. Um, because yeah, some people have been very excited by, oh, there's a blue one, or, or rather there's a purple one, but it just seems to be this kind of variable flushing color. We haven't looked um, actually at the difference in UV, but we know um, like from Elizabeth McCarthy's work in the Cotiana, that there can be really different, quite stark differences in the UV reflectance as well, even for things that look uh, basically white or, or or similarly off-white, wow. so that would be that would be pretty cool still. But yeah, they are they are all all white. <laughs> all right. Yes. Then there is a question of uh, Luis Augusto Calvo Santos. If you want to yeah. turn on your microphone, um, you can. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Stephen, by this really nice talk. I was uh, wondering about the uh, this possible correlation between chromosome numbers and genome size, or if there is no correlation. But this uh, group have a rapid recent uh, radiation. So perhaps this chromosome her organization, it was to prevent illegitimate recombination or something like that. And uh, perhaps this 
not a diff huge difference in genome sizes because it was not enough time to lose large portions of DNA. Yeah, good good points. I mean, you're definitely right. There could be a whole bunch, there could be you know basic reasons um, to do with recombination and meiosis and so on that would stimulate this kind of change in chromosome number. Um, there are other stochastic mechanisms that could explain it, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, wait and see. I guess this is kind of all the stuff that we're doing, but uh, I think because this it's so recurrent, there has to be something else going on there. Um, in terms of the genome size, yeah, again, it could be you're right. It could be that there hasn't been enough time necessarily. What we don't know is, you know, with more time, would we see uh, a complete diploid genome size and and n equals twelve or lower? Actually, in the diploid species, um, there are like in Alati where they have fewer than 12 chromosomes. Um, so this is not um, the change in chromosome number and these types of processes are not exclusively uh, a post polyploid phenomenon. Of course, anyway, all of plants have gone through multiple rounds of, of polyploidy. So it's kind of, I guess, in different groups at different points, we're focusing in on the process um, you know, as it's occurring at different places. Um, but I think you're right. I think it will be perhaps tricky um, and interesting to try and decipher which um, which of these changes are, are stochastic or the ones that are un unexpected, are they due to uh, the timing involved rather than anything particularly ad adaptive? Yeah. Oh. Thank you. It's also really interesting this, that's possible this genome restructuring could be related to adaptation to this particular location science. There are a lot of species that are, is adapted to this dry region. So it's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thank you. And then, of course, there is a lot of congratulations from Samina, Rose Samuel, Rosa Rodriguez Peña, because of the aesthetic fascinating story, so well documented, a great overview of all this work is amazing. Then there is also okay. a question from Giuliano Giovanni. Uh, mm -hmm. He says that suaviolentes means nicely smelling. Is there anything distinctive about the volatiles produced by species in uh, this question? Yeah, very good question as well. So uh, yeah, I should just really say without sound like a broken record that um, that's the one thing I didn't mention about flowers, but again, there's definitely variation in the, in the volatiles between the species and some of them are highly scented. Um, I've never seen, Suavio, there's, so there's a species, Suavia lens itself. Um, I've not seen, Mark, um, Mark has seen that in the wild. So presumably you know, that has a bit more of a, of a scent to it. So that's based, the section name based on that one. Of the ones that I have seen in the wild and I have grown, there, there is a variable scent. Um, and again, whether this definitely relates to pollination or not would be really interesting because some of the, it's a bit loose, but some of the larger flowered ones uh, tend to be ones that are uh, more strongly scented and they are less uh, capable. All of them are capable of self-pollination, but some of them self a lot less. And that seems to be variable between populations, particularly of the large flowered ones. So yeah, it would be really fantastic to look. Um, a few years ago, I sort of started those discussions, but we didn't quite have the material or, or, or the people to do it. Um, but it would be really, really interesting to look at the volatiles as well. I'm, I'm super interested in how uh, selfing and outcrossing might be varying in this group. You know, if they're all predominantly selfing from a polyploid, you know, this often, often happens in, uh, the rec in recent time with polyploids. Um, you know, they self a lot, you know, that's the only thing they can do, etc. And then things change. Um, and it may be related also to the environmental conditions. So I think there's huge potential here for, for looking at, at that kind of floral biology as well, which hopefully we'll get into or, or someone else will get into as well. But I would like to look at that. Good question. That's great. Yes, Julian said thanks. And then there is a question from uh, Vic Amster. I think he wants to turn on his microphone, probably. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. <clears throat> that was a really Hi. fun talk. I that's so much work done on this that I haven't followed in recent years, and it was great to be see a summary of it. 
Thank you. One of the questions I had was that the, the fascinate, I was fascinated by the chromosome reduction, I mean, uh, and also the reduction in genome size. Yeah. Um, but that apparently isn't seen in the other allopolyploids outside of suaviolentes in the question. Any, any yeah. uh, speculation about why this is different? Yeah, a, a very good question. Um, so in the other groups, yeah, they all retain the expected number of chromosomes. And the very recent ones, so like Tabacum or Rustica, show the uh, pretty much the expected genome size, if you like, if you just summed up the genome sizes of the, the closest uh, parental uh, diploids. Um, and then the others show actually variable downsizing and upsizing. So in like Rapandi, which is 4 million years old, one of the species um, shows quite significant downsizing, but the same number of chromosomes, and the other three show, show slight upsizing. So, but, but compared to Suave Lentis, they're very stable. They're very, you know, apart from the chromosome number, the genome size and the repeat content. So the bulk of these genomes are these repetitive elements and, it, and they're remar remarkably stable. In Suave Lentis, it just seems to be a whole bunch of other stuff happening. So with the genome size reduc reduction, actually, when I looked at the repetitive DNA, it's very, it's very similar. It's like confusingly similar when you've got huge um, changes in genome size. You know, we're talking about many Arabidopsis genomes in terms of the chain, the, the amount of genome size change and chromosome number change. But actually, when you look at the repetitive elements that make up the bulk of the genome, it's surprisingly similar. So that kind of, I'm still, you know, delving into that now to try and see if we can tease apart what's going on there. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It, it, Definitely, we have a nice kind of comparative series um, to look across. Uh, previously, I looked at Benthamiana repeats and genome size versus those other sections. And yeah, you just generally see a lot more downsizing, um, a lot more turnover. Uh, but why precisely they do it and others don't is a good question. Um, we also know very little about Africana, which is the uh, sister to the rest of Suaviolentes and occurs in Namibia. You know, whether if you do some field work in Namibia, you find a bunch of stuff going on there with that one, or um, is a very different, very, very different um, kind of plant as well, really that one. But yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. The answer is I don't know, but um, at least we have these kind of comparisons to make because hopefully it will give us hints as to what's going on. Thank you. No, yeah, thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you. Then there is a question of Federico Roda. Uh, he wants to do it. Um... Hi, uh, nice talk, uh, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the technique. So you use both RATSEEK and 353, and it seems like the RATSEEK work even better, at least similarly to 353. So yeah. do you think it worked better? Okay, yeah, so I yeah, kind of skimmed over uh, all of that really, in it, but uh, they're not re it's not really a fair comparison um, because uh, RAD sequencing is kind of, you get as much data as you, you get as many loci and, and, and SNPs as you throw at it, um, as you'll know. So, you know, you chop up your genomes with the same restriction enzymes and then you sequence as much as you want or can. So in, in those comparisons, you know, we've got, you know, millions of SNPs there versus the 353, we have up to 353 nuclear genes, um, parts of the exons, not the full gene necessarily, and some of the intronic regions closely, uh, close, close to them. So um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's really a fair comparison. And I would say the RAD sequencing um, at that scale that we've been doing is kind of more towards um, you know, low coverage, entire genome sequencing in the kind of scale of it. But so, and uh, the cost we were kind per of, sample, what was it? The cost per sample, was it bigger or lower with RADSEQ? Uh, the cost per sample for RADSEQ, um, once you've set it all up, is pretty low. Um, but it depends. So if you do, the most expensive part is really 
uh, having all the adapters ready to go. So you'll put you'll spend quite a lot if you're starting it just yourself and you don't you're not already doing it or uh, with labs close by. Um, it's mostly buying all those adapters and primers to begin with. That's the main the main bulk of the cost, um, and perhaps some of like the size selection equipment. But after you've done that, the, the cost per sample is very cheap for the library prep. And then for the sequencing itself, it's again, it's as, it's as much as you want to sequence in terms to get as many low size as you want. Um, the cost for A353 is pretty low, but similarly, if you, um, there is a little bit of a, a similar story there that if you sequence more from your hybridized A353 library, you're more likely to reco recover longer parts of those genes and more of the intronic regions around them, which for uh, recent groups at this kind of level, you're more likely to get more um, informative sites there. And, and then I had a, another question, which is, uh, at least theoretically with RADSEQ, an advantage of RADSEQ is that you should be able to do some functional analysis or at least uh, map those reads to a genome and look uh, yeah. for different, maybe functional things. Are you planning to do that? I guess you would need to use the other Nicotiana genomes to do that, which might be problematic. Yeah. So this is, um, I mean, this kind of stuff is really what um, Luis um, and Ovidio and others are doing at the moment, I think, in, in Vienna. So one of the problems has been that the Benthamiana genome has been very fragmented uh, and that kind of, that makes it a bit tricky to really get at this because all of this, you know, even in a, in a, a normal polyploid, if you like, you, you need to resolve those paralogs in order to really answer most of those questions properly. But with this additional uh, genome restructuring, you definitely, we definitely need that. Um, but there is, you know, there hasn't been recently a, a much better assembly of that one coming out. Uh, and we're hoping to um, better assemble, um, sequence and assemble a few more across the group. So that will give us better references and, and you're right, definitely you can use the RAD data to really um, investigate that a bit more. So we're, we're planning a kind of a combination of approaches in the future based on whole genomes and RAD to kind of get at the, the adaptive angle. Okay, thanks a lot. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. And then there is a question from Paul Gonzalez and also from Gabriela Doria about the pollination in Nicosiana section Suaviolentes. So Paul asked actually if, there, if this is different, like the pollination is different between different species, and if this could help to understand diversification or niche conservatives. And then, yeah. oh, sorry. Sorry, no, no, go on, yeah, perhaps let's roll it into one. No, then it's uh, only Gabriela, that she, she's saying that uh, they have found all the species examined so far for petal cell shape in sections of violentance to have non-conical cells. Um, and that's interesting because thinking about pollination, that color and petal cell shape seems to be fixed and scent is viable. Mm. That's interesting, yeah. And I'd really like to chat um, about wh which, which uh, species you've looked at. So um, I kind of did kind of do a bit of a poo-poo on, on gene banks and, and seed collections and stuff right at the beginning. I'll revise that slightly because some of the um, now that we have a much better grip um, grip on the you know, on the entire group, we know that some of the things that have been labelled um, as a particular species in um, in uh, collect, uh, germplasm collections where you can get seeds easily, or that have been growing for a while, they are definitely that 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 species, even if we don't know particularly the population or the geography, the the locality. Um, others are, you know, I wouldn't necessarily trust them unless you're really sure. So, you know, I've worked previously on a bunch of things, even from the Australian seed bank, um, and it's all a bit of a mess. Some things have grown up and they're uh, rustica, you know, bright yellow flowers from South America, something else completely. So you have to be a bit careful, but I would be really interested, um, Gabriella, in hearing which ones you've looked at. And maybe, um, yeah, if you or, or someone else would like to look at uh, some of the other ones that definitely they won't be, um, you probably haven't looked at them because they're not available. Uh, widely, and uh, particularly these ones where there seems to be something changing with the pollination syndrome, uh, I would be really interested. But you, you could definitely be right you know, that the, the the cell shape has been fixed early on, 
and the color has probably been pretty fixed. But there is this length of corolla tube, uh, corolla lobe change, and probably volatiles um, changing as well. It, it seems like, but yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I think I always hear like probably she can turn on the microphones. I like it because I, I yeah, that would be good. She gave a talk and about the this all her work. I can't remember very well which uh, were the species. Oh, okay, I missed that one. I should I'll find that. Um. I don't have all the list of, of the species we have correct, but there were uh, it was very through the the so we thought we had it complete more or less for like two years ago, but uh, yes, so it would be very very good to to make sure the identifications of the sources we got the seeds from are correct, and also yeah. look the new material you you might have. It, I yeah, I would I would. I would definitely be wary about uh, you just have to be a bit skeptical um, and it's kind of a bit this group is a bit weird amongst Nicotiana because it's such a well-studied genus and a lot of the other sections um, and species are so so you know they've been studied for so long that they're really clear but with this section I take everything with a, a little pinch of salt um, but it'd be really yeah it'd be really good to have a chat about that and yeah and, sure and see, in touch. thank you Stephen thanks and thank you, everyone. I think there's no more questions. Uh, yes, there were a lot of questions. Uh, super interesting and a great talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. And yes, it no was a great talk with uh, a great work with um, Mark Chase and Martin. So thank you very much. And of course, like next uh, next week, uh, next Friday, we have another soul seminar online. Um, we are going to be um, more focused on cellular biology and plant physiology in that seminar. And Lidar Sharmosh, he's going to present um, in a talk about our homologous cell types translationally conserved across plant species. And he's going to present lessons from tomato, but not only tomato, also from rice and arabidopsis, root adults actually. So see you everyone next Friday. And thank you. Thank you for being here and, and sharing your research. So bye. <laughs>